Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna give it a few more minutes here while people are popping in, but I figure I'd take the time now to introduce our panelists and um, just again, welcome all of you for being here. I know um, as it seems every week, it's a crazy, crazy tech policy week and day. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate all of you taking the time to chat about a really important topic. Um, so first I'm Sam, um, Sam Sabin. I'm over at Morning Consult reporting on tech policy and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And we also have four lovely um, brilliant panelists with us today as well. Uh, David Brody, who is the Council and Senior Fellow for Privacy and Technology at um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. We have uh, Yosef Gitachu, uh, Director of the Media and Democracy Program at Common Cause. Spandy Singh, uh, the policy analyst or our policy analyst at New America's Open Technology Institute. And then Ian Vanderwalker, the Senior Counsel at Brennan Center for Justice. Um, and then throughout today's program, um, I think we're dedicating going to feel it out, but probably about 15 minutes or so at the end for any questions that um, the audience might have. So do not be shy about hitting the Q&A button if you're on Zoom or um, submitting a question elsewhere if you're a part of the live stream audience today. Um, the more questions, the better. So uh, very excited um, to dive in. So I think just seeing, uh, yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so I guess first, and I'll, I'll open this up to the entire panel just to get things rolling, but I would love, as we all kind of know, um, you know, 2016 was very much um, a time where a heavy spotlight was cast on just the sheer amount of misinformation and disinformation that's seen on social media platforms uh, related to um, the U.S. elections. And so with that in mind, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, just the kinds of um, tactics we see when um, it comes to the spread of misinformation and disinformation online to start and how, how that's kind of changed between 2016 and 2020. Sure, I, I, I can kick us off uh, and, and thank you for, for having us. Um, so I, I think one of the big shifts from, from 2016 to today is um, today uh, the calls are coming from inside the house, so to speak. 2016 was primarily about foreign interference and, and there was some domestic efforts, but you know, it was what, what Russia did when it was targeting African American voters with voter suppression propaganda and what other uh, related actors did. It was all, um, it, it was primarily foreign driven. What we're seeing today is primarily domestic activity. It's domestic actors, uh, disproportionately President Trump and his supporters and, and, and uh, echo chamber. Um, pushing disinformation and misinformation uh, about a variety of topics. And, and to the extent that foreign actors are engaging in the US election, they're largely just amplifying uh, false information that's already being pushed by domestic actors. Yeah, I can uh, jump in here. Uh, so thanks uh, to New America for hosting this and Sam for moderating this. Um, I, I wanna comment on what David said in a second, but I think to kind of um, pull us back a little bit, I, I think it's helpful to categorize some of the tactics around um, online voter suppression and election disinformation. Um, one of the big categories is date and time. Um, it's really important that people know what day the election is and um, what are the hours they can vote? Um, bad actors like to put out content on social media that say Democrats vote Wednesday or Republicans vote uh, on Monday or vote the week after or things like that, just to sow confusion. Um, with COVID, I think date and time has become even more uh, an important way to spread disinformation. You have bad actors saying things like um, seniors have special hours to vote because of COVID or um, because of social distancing rules, uh, uh, there's, there's differences in how you can vote and, and where you can vote. Um, 
the other big category is deceptive practices, uh, which kind of tell you, um, give you false information about how you can vote. So bad actors sometimes say um, text to vote or call this number to vote um, as opposed to legitimate ways to cast your, your ballot. Um, because of the COVID, and again, bad actors are saying things like uh, text your vote because of COVID or um, vote from home because of COVID. Uh, so just using the, the virus as a way to um, spread misinformation and disinformation. Um, another point uh, is voter intimidation. Um, this is something that President Trump likes to amplify through his base by uh, encouraging folks to quote unquote monitor the polls or use intimidation tactics to scare people from actually going to the polls. Um, we've seen false claims saying things like uh, ICE is out there, uh, so don't, don't vote because you may get deported, things like that. Um, and then building off of this are voter suppression narratives. Um, the president has continuously used social media to say that um, vote by mail will lead to massive voter fraud and election rigging. It's entirely untrue and been discredited. Uh, it's, it's a way that, that we've been voting for years now, but this is one of the ways he likes to sow discord. Um, so th those are the big categories, um, but to build off what David was saying, um, you know, these tactics have only amplified since 2016. And to the extent that it was foreign actors, it's, it's now domestic actors just taking the playbook from foreign actors uh, and amplifying it. And, and the goal is to really just spread as much disinformation as possible to create confusion and to make sure anyone who's undecided does not vote. Um, that's really the, the biggest tactic of voter suppression is to take marginalized communities like low income folks, people of color and immigrant communities and make sure that they don't cast their ballot as a way to swing the election one way or the other. Yeah, um, I mean, I think you all summarized it beautifully. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think maybe the natural next question, right, is when we're thinking about the kinds of content that we're seeing and how it's changing, it would be ridiculous if we didn't talk about also the role of social media companies in this and how they're adapting and um, learning or filling in the gaps or maybe not filling in the gaps uh, in certain ways as well. And so um, maybe to turn it back to you, Yosef, and then I'd also love to bring Spandy into this conversation given uh, New America's recent report on this topic, which side note, I recommend if you all have not checked it out yet to dive, spend some a good amount of time sitting with it. It is filled with amazing detail and history about all of the um, various social media platforms and the work that they've done on this topic, um, which is, it's so hard to keep up. So a beautiful resource, but um, I guess either for Yosef or for Spandy right now, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, how social media companies have adapted their, po their policies and changed in the past four years as well. Sure, I'm happy to jump in there. So as um, Sam mentioned, we came out with a report yesterday that looks at how 10 different internet platforms have been addressing um, election related misinformation and disinformation. Um, and we primarily look at these efforts in four categories. Um, the first is how platforms are connecting users to authoritative information. The second is how they are moderating or curating misleading information. The third is looking at misleading information and advertising. And the fourth is how and if they're providing meaningful transparency and accountability around these efforts. And so I think compared to the 2016 elections, platforms are definitely taking a more proactive approach when it comes to connecting users to authoritative information. So for example, Facebook and Twitter um, both have dedicated spaces on their websites where users can access voting information. And they, a lot of companies have partnered with um, election authorities and other legitimate legitimate sources to um, sort of promote verified information. Um, in terms of content policies and advertising policies, platforms have also definitely flushed out um, those approaches a lot more. And with content moderation, we're seeing that companies are also using uh, what I like to call middle ground moderation techniques, um, such as downranking and labeling um, a lot more than they were during 2016. And we're also seeing platforms really address the role that algorithms can play in promoting this kind of content um, and intervening to try and ensure that, you know, conspiracy theories are not being promoted through recommendations. Um, 
I will say, however, one of the biggest challenges that we're still seeing is that platforms do not provide adequate transparency around exactly what these, the impact of these policies are. So for example, out of the 10 companies we looked at in the report, only one company, which was Twitter, publishes any concrete data related to their, um, how their content moderation efforts impact election related content. And Twitter only started reporting on this data very recently. And so, and we have a similar lack of transparency when it comes to advertising. And so because of this, like, although we know platforms are being more proactive and they are doing more, it's really difficult to understand what the impact of these efforts are. Yeah, building off of that, uh, first kudos to OTI for putting together that comprehensive report on uh, platform um, policies on disinformation, super helpful. Um, you know, I think platforms are, are taking a mix of a proactive and a reactive approach. Um, all the things that Spandy mentioned are things that they've been doing for a while. Um, but the, the challenge is that even when they're taking a proactive approach, they're still, um, election disinformation that's running rampant on their platforms. Um, part of the challenge here is that uh, the, the policies they're putting in place aren't adequate or may have holes in them that are preventing them from, from actually taking enforcement actions uh, when appropriate. Um, the other challenge is that uh, these policies um, may just not be adequate enough. Um, so for example, Facebook still has a gaping hole in its political ad policies, right? Where they allow politicians to, to lie, uh, more or less. Uh, and so it's, it's been a challenge of really communicating with platforms to figure out, okay, how are your policies um, actually um, strong and can you consistently enforce them? So for example, can a platform um, consistently put a, a warning label or a fact check label on a uh, piece of content that violates their policies as opposed to doing it in some instances versus another. And where the policies just don't actually allow the platforms to take action, can they modify their policies uh, in a way where they can take proactive action? Great, and, and something that kind of came to mind while you all were speaking about this is just also I would imagine um, the timing for these policies is probably also so important, right? We're, a, maybe roughly a month away from the election and uh, we're still getting new updated policies from Facebook and from Google with regards to um, their political ads and how they'll moder or restrict those or um, what types of content they'll be cracking down on. And so I, I'd love, I guess I'll open it up to the entire panel here um, to see if anyone, just to hear a little bit more about how timing um, plays into this and if there are any concerns about the fact that Facebook might be doing something too late or too soon or Facebook or any of the other social media companies. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in just to say um, that it is kind of mind boggling that we're four years away from 2016 and we're still getting updates about um, you know, massive corporations that are in some ways still responding to those problems. I mean, in other ways, there are new problems, right? There are new challenges. So they are, are of course, in some sense, trying to be adaptive to address those new things. But also, I mean, as Joseph said, they're being reactive. They see something in the news and they think it's a bad PR issue for them. And so they come out with something that um, is intended to address it. Um, and that, you know, that both makes it hard to see how the problem is being addressed, but it also has negative consequences for legitimate organizing on these uh, platforms. So there are groups out there who are trying to play by the rules, who are not trying to engage in disinformation, but who are trying to engage in uh, political organizing, get out the vote efforts, um, and it gets swept, swept up in these rules and swept up in the changes to these rules. So you know it's important to recognize in this conversation that yes, there are tools um, to try to tamp down the disinformers, um, but other people are trying to play by those rules who may be uh, negatively affected by some of the, some of those rules and, and the enforcement, which isn't always across the board. Yeah, the, the, the other thing I'd say about it is, you know, waiting until the last minute to update their policies is a conscious choice. Um, the, these platforms, you know, all of our organizations and plenty of, of other organizations and people who are who are very interested in protecting elections 
have been raising these alarms literally since 2016, or in some cases since before 2016. Uh, we, you know, we've we've talked to the companies, we've proposed ideas. There's been countless meetings, uh, and and the the companies have have deliberately chosen to to wait to come up with a plan, and they've chosen to call audibles at the last minute. Uh, the, and those choices have, have consequences, uh, like Ian was saying. Also, the, the, the other consequences are the companies, their, their own staff and contractors don't know how to enforce their own policies because they change at the last minute. So we, you know, Twitter just changed its civic integrity policy a few weeks ago, and they made really positive changes. It's great that they took those steps but they're not enforcing their new rules. So, you know, we, we're in a situation where they're, they're saying we're not going to allow uh, content that makes baseless allegations of, of rigged elections or voter fraud. Uh, meanwhile, the, the president and others tweet such things regularly and, and, and there's not any significant consequence to that because I doubt their own enforcement staff has, has been properly trained on rules that came into effect just a week or two ago. Um, similarly, the, the, the platforms uh, are struggling to, to properly label content. So, you know, um, Facebook, Twitter, other platforms have made a big deal about how they're putting these labels on uh, political posts saying, you know, voting by mail is safe and secure, click here for more information, things like that. But they're not, there, there's two fundamental flaws in how they're doing it. First, in the case of Facebook, they're putting that same label on every piece of political content, regardless of whether it's true or false, regardless of whether it violates Facebook's rules or doesn't. And what that means is that that label effectively becomes just another piece of noise and clutter on the site that users will ignore. It doesn't signal anything significant to the user if it appears everywhere, right? You know, think about all the times you go to a website and some random thing pops up and you just click for it to go away because you don't want to see it and it doesn't matter. It's the same kind of filler. Um, what they need to do instead is only put labels on content that, that violates the rules um, and the label needs to be somewhat particularized to the rule that's being violated. And it needs to say very clearly this post is violating this rule or engaging in this type of activity, but we're leaving it up because we think it's really important for people to see this information, but they need to be properly informed. So we're labeling it so that you know. Uh, and, and furthermore, the content should be hidden behind an interstitial that has that label so that the user knows before they see the content that there's a problem here. Uh, the sites regularly do this for all kinds of other graphic content involving violence or, or or other sensitive types of content, they're they're perfectly capable of doing it, and and they've made a choice not to. Totally. I would also add that. Oh, sorry, I would also add that when we talk about political ads, like as David mentioned, the rules are constantly changing, but the definitions around political ads are also pretty fluid, and so even even companies who have banned political ads outright, there are still ads that slip through the cracks, and um, companies aren't really able to or they just don't share, you know, like what, what does slip through the cracks? How often does it slip through the cracks? What's the review process like? Um, and I think right now, one of the only companies that does that is Reddit in context of political ads, but Reddit also has, also accepts a much more narrow scope of political ads. Like it's only US based, it's only at the federal level. Um, but without that kind of information, it's also difficult to know, like, you know, what are the limitations of these approaches as well? Totally. And I, I want to circle back up on the ways in which it's moderated, especially the labels versus completely removing and things of that nature. But before we do that, um, probably diving into the actual content itself and familiarizing people with that. Uh, it's probably <laughs> good stuff in the flow. And so I guess, the, you know, I, I'm curious to hear a bit more about the challenges facing social media companies when it comes to mis and disinformation that's shared through organic content or just you know stuff that your typical user is sending there's very there's no paid promotion um i am curious to hear a bit about what set of challenges having so much organic content being the source of this poses for a social media company of course it varies by platform but yeah 
Yeah, I mean, one thing to note is it's very hard. There's a lot of content and that means you can't read everything, right? It's been true that you couldn't read everything on Facebook for many years. I mean, it's billions and billions of posts. Um, so that makes, and then in the, now that nobody's in the office, they are, that's another reason to, to have less human beings reviewing things. Um, so Facebook, you know, makes a big deal about having 20,000 human reviewers or something, but, you know, in the context of billions of pieces of, um, content, that's literally nothing. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket. So they're relying a lot on algorithms <clears throat> and, um, you know, algorithms aren't that smart <laughs> in this context. Uh, they tend to look for keywords. They don't know the difference between uh, somebody saying vote on Wednesday because they're trying to trick voters and somebody else saying people are saying vote on Wednesday because they're trying to trick voters, um, right? An algorithm thinks both of those, one, one a warning about voter suppression, one actual voter suppression. They think both of those were the same thing. Um, and so they get caught up in the same, um, sort of review process, whatever that is, um, whether that's a takedown or otherwise. And then, you know, in theory, there's supposed to be a human being who sort of appealed, you can appeal to if you think you had a mistaken um, either takedown or other negative consequence on your account, but people report that those processes aren't very um, responsive either. So, uh, you know, in some sense, Facebook, and just, it's just Facebook, but Facebook is just, it's almost like too large to police or at least to police at the level that they're that they're trying to do. I mean, really, if they wanted, if they need human review, and if they if they're actually going to do human review, it would be, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, so you know, and, and and then part of it is the things that they're the things that are there for human review, like you know, groups like ours can flag things for them, and they don't they're not always responsive to that even either, even when a human being is telling them that there's a problem. So. Uh, it's definitely a problem of scale, and then and then that leads to reliance on algorithms, which have sort of systematic ways that they fail. Yeah, and if I could just add one thing on there to sort of illustrate the situation a little bit. So, like, like Ian was saying, Facebook probably has one of the largest enforcement teams in the industry. It's it's twenty to thirty thousand people, something like that. Okay, but Facebook has a couple billion users. Uh, the last time I ran the numbers, what this shakes out to is they have about one enforcement person per 70,000 users. So, you know, imagine if you had uh, 70,000 people is a small city. Imagine if you had one police officer for 70,000 people. And that's the best equipped, best resourced company in the industry. So that sort of tells you a little bit about the scale of the problem. Facebook is, you know, very eager to say like, oh, we have 30,000 people working on this. And it's like, okay, that's a drop in the bucket. Totally, yeah. Yeah, um, I'll, just one quick point I wanna make. I, I think the challenge with orga organic content is just the way it can get amplified on the various platforms and seeing quickly. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get more into this later, I believe, but the differences between an ad and organic content is that, you know, anyone, all your, all of your followers or friends can see organic content and they can share it quickly. And so if you're uh, someone like Trump who has uh, tens of millions of followers on Twitter, you can put anything on your personal account or your campaign's account and it can get traction through retweets and likes and other ways to share. And you know that, that's something to moderate when uh, you have potentially millions of people seeing um, a piece of disinformation quickly and reacting to it and sharing it as opposed to other types of disinformation through um, content on groups or content and ads that pose other challenges. And I would also add that when we think about how platforms are addressing organic content, now that they're using you know, more than just removing content, um, it's important to think about like what, what approaches are sufficient. So um, in our report, one of the things that we recommend is that if a user engages with misleading information around the elections, then platforms should notify them and direct them to authoritative information so that they're closing the loop there and they're not just removing the content, they're helping the user 
understand that the content was wrong and access more verified information. And a lot of platforms were doing that in the context of COVID-19 misinformation. So I definitely think it's, it is something that they can clearly do. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not they want to. Yeah, and, and to build on what Spandy was saying, it's, it's not just important for correcting the user in that moment, but if you tell a user that, oh, you were looking at news from, you know, xyzsite.com and that was misinformation, that user is then going to know like, okay, maybe I can't trust this site. Maybe I should look elsewhere for my information going forward. So there, there's a prospective inoculation that happens there that's really important. Totally. And, and also when we're talking about organic content, something that I'm thinking about often, um, it's also just this push that we're seeing with social media companies to be more interconnected, to, um, I keep picking on Facebook, but they had many a policy change in the last 24 hours. So maybe poor timing in that regard, but, um, you know, they, Facebook's making this huge push to um, promote groups, these private um, messages and things of that nature. I'm curious to hear a little bit about how maybe that can also make it more difficult or not um, to moderate for organic content that contains um, misinformation and disinformation. I mean, a lot of the QAnon content is spread through groups um, and it's, yeah, I'm just so curious about how that plays into this as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the things with, I mean, so Facebook likes to say it's connecting people and um, it is one of its responses to issues, is some of the issues we're talking about, we're talking about is that it's promoting more, you're going to see real content from real people that you know, right? So your mom or your cousin or whatever, but groups sort of um, belie that in that groups uh, are typically formed around interests. They blossom, they bloom in size very quickly. Um, and as you said, these, these pieces of disinformation are frequently shared there, as well as sort of uh, what you might call just sort of polarizing content or extremist content that's not exactly misleading, or that, that's not exactly false, but is about our side is good, their side is bad. Um, and one of, the, one of the sort of services that Facebook provides is group recommendations, right? So if you're in a group that's sort of dedicated to a conservative viewpoint, Facebook will recommend to you, well, here's these other groups that are even farther to the right. And here's these other groups that are even farther to the right. And that sort of pushes people through the group ecosystem to the most extremist ones, which again is where a lot of the, the really bad content, the COVID misinformation, the voting misinformation, the QAnon conspiracies that are literally causing death threats and violence um, are happening in those groups. And Facebook is not only, I mean, they are sh trying to shut them down to some degree or another, but they're not acknowledging that their algorithms actively push people into those groups. <laughs> and there are similar problems, of course, people have talked about the YouTube recommendation algorithms. There are similar problems on other platforms. Yeah, the other very big problem we've been seeing with, with Facebook groups in particular uh, is the way they're being used uh, to organize militia activities in the real world. So, you know, we saw in Kenosha that the, the Kenosha Guard Facebook group was used to, to mobilize uh, armed militiamen to uh, counter uh, racial justice demonstrators. And that resulted in, in three people being shot, two of them killed. Uh, and, you know, that Facebook group before the events in Kenosha happens, that Facebook group was reported to Facebook over 450 times for violating Facebook's rules. The, the, there were members of the group explicitly calling for, for violence and, and issuing calls for, to arms and trying to organize um, armed response, uh, and, and Facebook took no action. Uh, and similarly, you know, we are, we are seeing um, in multiple parts of the country, uh, how Facebook groups are, are being used to, you know, organize folks that want to interfere with the right to vote, that want to unlawfully intimidate voters at the polls, uh, that we, we've seen militias 
uh, setting up roadblock checkpoints and stopping drivers of color. Uh, and, and, you know, social media has not just enabled these individuals to find each other, it finds them and brings them together through the recommendation algorithms that, that Ian was talking about. Yeah, just a few quick points. Um, everyone's talked about all the challenges with the groups. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest challenges from a social media monitoring perspective is that uh, the groups are closed off, right? So it could be potentially thousands of people sharing disinformation without any sort of check from an outside voice to see is this wrong or is this inaccurate. Um, so there isn't a built-in tool for a civil society group or, or a nonpartisan group to actually help spread accurate information. Um, I, I think another challenge is that, as Ian was saying, with recommended groups that Facebook um, utilizes, it pushes you further and further to the extremist content. And I think there are situations where um, the group labeling or the, the group titles aren't as clear. So you could join something that seems innocuous or seems fine, and then all of a sudden you're involved in something that's sharing disinformation and potentially suppressing your vote or discouraging from how you think. So, you know, I think um, platforms need to figure out ways to create more transparency around how groups are actually operating um, and potentially think about if a group is a certain size um, to the point where it's potentially thousands of people in it, where any type of disinformation could um, create um, a lot of uh, harmful situations, what are the mitigating ways uh, to, to prevent that from happening, whether it's making it public or whether it's creating some sort of safeguards so this information doesn't spread quickly. Um, There's just a lot of dangers with how big a group can be in the size of scale of disinformation on groups. And I would actually like to give an example that's not Facebook related. Um, since Sam, you mentioned this interplay between the need for privacy and security, but also the need to address this kind of misleading and harmful content. Um, and I think a good example is how WhatsApp approaches this. Um, so WhatsApp offers end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services, which are critical for privacy and security. Um, but they also that also means that the company can't view or review the content that users are sharing. Um, but WhatsApp has introduced a number of measures. Again, I will caveat, as always, very little transparency. So we operate off of the few data points we get to try and understand whether these are effective. But WhatsApp has, for example, introduced um, limits on the number of times a message can be forwarded. Um, and if a message has already been forwarded five times, then the receiving user can only share it to um, other chats like one at a time. Um, the receiving user will also have a, it'll have a label on the message, letting them know that, you know, it has, it is a forwarded message. Um, so they can know that the person who's sending it to them is not the original source. Um, WhatsApp also recently introduced a feature that allows users to fact check messages that they receive um, through their browsers without having to compromise the encrypted nature of their messages. And then they've also been um, sort of using different tactics to try and identify Move accounts that engage in automated or spam-like behavior, which are often associated with uh, misinformation and disinformation spreading accounts. So um, according to WhatsApp, these, um, these approaches have helped reduce the virality of misinformation and disinformation on the services. Um, of course, with greater transparency, you know, uh, orgs like us can help corroborate that. But I, I do think it's important to recognize that um, it is important to strike a balance between privacy and security and the need to address these uh, kinds of harmful content, but it doesn't mean that just because you have privacy or security, you can't address that kind of content. Totally, totally. And um, just a reminder for the audience, we will be taking um, questions from you all. So if anything is sparking your curiosity, feel free to um, send them our way, uh, whether by the Q&A function in Zoom or other means if you're live streaming. But um, kind of want to pivot a bit from organic content to talk a bit about uh, paid political advertisements. Um, as we all know, um, Facebook, Google, others have been making a few changes to their political ad policy. Um, Political, yeah, political ad policies uh, with regards to the election. Um, we're going to see bans on Facebook the week of the election. Google is, um, or halting them, not a complete ban, but um, Google is uh, 
restricting them the week after the election. Um, we're seeing several companies make uh, restrictions in terms of political advertisements around uh, claiming who won the election since it might be a bit longer with all the up uh, ticket mail uh, mail in ballots. So I, I mean, I'm curious to hear a little bit about what you all make of these changes that have been made to political advertising policies with regards to um, election information and whether or not um, they're enough <laughs> to combat uh, the problem. Yeah, uh, you know, I'd say, sure, they're, they're positive developments, but they're, they're very small positive developments given the scope of, and scale of the problem. Uh, you know, to, to give an, another example, Google has one of the, the most problematic ad transparency libraries for its political ads. Uh, so, you know, all the major platforms have these, these libraries of political ads where you can go and see what different political actors are, are running on the site, even if you're not a target of the ad. In Google's case, however, they only include ads that explicitly name a candidate or an incumbent or a political party which means that the vast majority of, of political and election ads that, that don't explicitly name one of those people, one of those things, uh, don't go into the library and, and we have no, we don't even know that they exist. So, you know, we've had some, some recent circumstances where there were political ads run by super PACs, uh, spreading, you know, misinformation about voting by mail but because the, the ads don't mention a party or a candidate, they don't go into the library. And so the, the only way you learn about it is, is someone happens to see the ad and, and fortunately they report it to someone else who can report it up. But uh, the, the, you know, it, 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 if no one sees it, how are we supposed to have any sort of meaningful uh, accounting for what's happening through, through Google's platforms? And, and to be clear, you know, Google's platforms also include YouTube, which is a huge, huge vector for, for disinformation and misinformation. I would add that the data that a lot of these ad libraries share is also like pretty, it's helpful, it's a good first step, but if you're really trying to understand who saw these ads and what impact did they have, most of these ad libraries really lack granular engagement delivery data that can help us understand um, that kind of an outcome. Totally. Um, yeah, and I, I guess maybe with that, um, you know, it's been brought up a few different times. Actually, we're going to do a different question. Uh, <laughs> I guess maybe with that, I mean, it's been mentioned before. Um, the president is definitely been um, someone who has tested many of the content moderation guidelines uh, on several platforms when it comes to spreading or sharing uh, misinformation um, or misleading information even about the election. And, and so with that in mind, I'm curious as to how, um, how politicians kind of sharing misinformation about the election, particularly when it comes to mail-in voting or voter fraud, um, how that challenges or throws a wrench into social media companies' plans to um, take on this issue. I mean, each company has kind of done something different, right? So, um, and yeah, I'm just curious about that and, and whether you all think it's the role of a social media company to intervene in that instance. Um, I, I mean, I think that uh, companies definitely have a responsibility to ensure that users have access to information, especially from prominent figures like politicians, but they also have an equal responsibility to ensure that the content of their services is not going to, you know, result in like an offline imminent harm. And so I think that when a politician or prominent figure is posting something misleading or false related to the elections, users have a right to know that a candidate or government official is essentially lying to the public. Um, but I think, ooh, sorry, if companies have a clear public interest exception policy, uh, that can help address this. So if a politician posts content 
that is false, um, it's fact checked, it's debunked, the company can leave the content up, but they can label it. And this label should explain to users that the post has been debunked. Um, it should explain that there is a public interest in keeping this post up because users should know that that individual is spreading misleading or false information. Um, and it should importantly also connect users to verified information on whatever the subject of the post is. Um, but I will caveat this by saying that if a you know, if a politician is posing, uh, posting misleading or false content that poses imminent harm, like it's calling for violence, then the company should be removing that like it would any other user's posts. Um, I don't think that they should get an exception in that kind of a situation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think that the, the companies need to hold politicians to an even higher standard than they hold regular users for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, first off, these are our representatives and they're supposed to be, you know, embodying the values that we share as a society. And that includes adhering to the rule of law and, and norms about uh, appropriate uh, ways of conducting an election and ensuring that everyone has a safe and secure and easy, equal access to the right to vote. Uh, but it's also, um, it, it's just simple harm prevention, like, like Spandy was saying. These are users with gigantic megaphones. And if they say something that incites voter intimidation or uh, spreads misinformation about how or when or, or where to vote, it's a lot different than just your rank and file user saying something. These are people that speak with, with voices of authority and have huge followings and the media is going to repeat what they say and their supporters are going to repeat what they say and so the the the, the magnitude the risk of harm is quite high so you know my my feeling is the the platform should have an even stricter higher standard of review for politicians elected officials candidates for office where they're held to stricter rules uh, than, than regular users, where, um, you know, when they share misinformation or disinformation or voter intimidation or calls to arms or incitement of violence or, you know, anything like that, that, you know, we know these result in real world harms. When that happens, the content needs to come down. And it's the borderline content that should get labeled and flagged and, and, and you know, downranked. The actual violating content needs to come down. Totally. Um, and I, I'm going to ask you guys one last question before I turn it over to um, the questions we're getting from the audience. So just a reminder to those watching, feel free, pop in your questions. Um, but I, we brought up the um, the impact that the pandemic has had on content moderation earlier, the um, issues surrounding, uh, you know, it's not really safe for people to be in an office uh, unless you go through many different um, guidelines and safety procedures. And so a lot of these platforms have turned more to algorith algorithms and to moderate content. And of course, algorithms have many flaws <laughs> um humans aren't perfect either but um you know algorithms maybe aren't smart in this area or as we all know have many biases um in regulating content and so I, i'd love to hear a little bit um, more again from anyone who wants to um hop in um just about how um you know relying more on algorithms during this time during um, a heated election um might be also throwing a, adding another challenge to this issue. Yeah, I mean, I would say that when we talk about the fact that platforms are increasing their reliance on automated tools, like we shouldn't be thinking of it in a binary. So it's not that they are only using automated tools or not. We need to, and I think it really varies from platform to platform, whether they're using tools more for detection or for moderation. Um, but as Ian was mentioning earlier, like algorithmic tools definitely are flawed. They're unable to uh, sort of effectively detect and moderate content that doesn't have clear definitions. So like disinformation, hate speech, terror propaganda. Um, they also can't make subjective and contextual decision making. So they are, there are clear limitations. Um, but I think in the context of the election, like honestly from, especially from just doing the research from the report, it's really unclear 
to what extent companies are using uh, um, automated tools for moderating election content. Uh, Facebook, for example, has set up like a Facebook uh, elections operations center that they said was going to have human moderators reviewing content 72 hours before the election. Now, because there's a lot of uh, early voting, they've sort of expanded that period. But there, there's a lot of focus, I think, on uh, emphasizing, like David saying, like, you know, we're hiring more people, we have a lot of people working on this, but there's not a similar level of transparency around how those people interface with their algorithmic systems and how those systems are being used at all in general. And just, you know, a couple things to add on to that is, uh, I, I totally agree, algorithms are not inherently good or bad. It, it's all about how they're used. Um, so, for example, you know, I think we've sort of seen some examples of, of different platforms setting the threshold differently for, for when an algorithm is going to trigger something for further review or, or take it down. Uh, you know, I, I believe there is some recent reporting that uh, Google's algorithm they, it, on YouTube, they chose to be a little more aggressive in, in, in what they were going to automatically take down. Uh, whereas I, I feel like on Facebook and Twitter, they're, they're less aggressive. Um, you know, that's a calibration issue. But the other things that, that algorithms can do that are positive is uh, what is, there's a proposal from the Center for American Progress to set up circuit breakers, where if certain content is going viral very quickly, you know, the algorithm can spot that, intervene and sort of act as a circuit breaker to, to slow it down or stop the virality while the, the, the human moderators have a chance to check it. Uh, so, you know, that's a, an important thing that an algorithm can do, uh, but things that algorithms can't do, like Sandy was saying, is, is, is evaluate the context in a, in a nuanced and, and culturally competent way. So when we're talking about the, the accounts of major politicians and other major figures on these platforms, the people whose follower counts are in the hundreds of thousands to millions, those people should sort of be in a separate bucket where there are dedicated human review teams that are just tasked with keeping an eye on those high impact accounts uh, in, in real time or near real time to, to check for uh, problems that could occur around the election. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and so I, I'm going to turn it over to our audience questions. And I, I'm doing this because I think this is a good transition one. But um, the first question I have for you all um, from the audience is, is, should any political advertising on um, electronic or social media be forbidden straight out? Um, the more little rules you add, the more loopholes you create. I'll just say, I think, um, I, I think a lot of groups in this space sort of struggle with this idea. Um, banning political ads uh, has the potential to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are, um, you know, social media ads are an extremely powerful tool and they're extremely cheap and they're available to those candidates who don't have a lot of money, to these like small organizers who don't have a lot of resources and want to get their message out. And the idea of sweeping all that away, um, <clears throat> I think causes a lot of uh, concerns. Uh, it, it's definitely the case that creating rules creates loopholes, bad actors will try to find ways around the rules, we'll try to find the loopholes, we'll try to find holes in enforcement. But I, I tend to think that, you know, that's the situation we're in. Um, we don't sort of ban entire other, you know, media from having political rules, we try from having political messages. Um, we try to make sure that those messages like uh, attain some standard. And imperfect as that is, I think it's better than shutting everything down. Yeah, um, to build off what Ian was saying, I think there are two sides or two extremes, however you want to look at it. One is um, 
leave political ads unchecked, which is more or less what Facebook is doing, or maybe what Twitter is doing is just not uh, allowing political ads to run um, in pretty much all cases. I mean, my, my personal belief is that I'd rather have no political ads run than political ads with blatant lies that uh, are getting targeted to uh, marginalized communities to prevent them from voting. Uh, but that being said, I, I think what we all want is a is an enforceable political ad system where there are rules of the road and it's not just anyone can say whatever they want without any type of moderation um, or at least some sort of uh, limitations on how ads can be can be run, whether it's it's targeting um, or other ways that ads are getting out to certain audiences. Um, there, there are just a lot of harmful ways that, that ads are being used. Uh, and so if it's a policy situation where we are promoting labeling or, or warning or fact checks on ads, or it's limiting how they're targeted or how they're seen, um, you know, those are the types of things we, we should be striving for, um, as opposed to one way or the other, just letting ads run unchecked or not at all. Yeah, I would also add that, um, I think both David and, I'm oh, sorry, Yosef and Ian made really great points. Um, I'm not sure how I would approach the ban on political ads, but I think that when we think of how companies are thinking through their policies, um, one of the biggest challenges I've noticed is that even to find companies' approach to political ads or even organic content, you have to dig through their websites to figure out like, oh, you changed this three days ago. Okay, but what about this change three months ago? Um, and like one example I can give um, both for the ads and organic context is like Facebook has community standards and that's supposed to outline, uh, you know, what's permissible. They have their political ads policies, which are on the business side of things. Um, but when they are talking about elections, all of these updates are in blog posts. They're in posts by Mark Zuckerberg on his personal like Facebook page. They're in, you know, they're in a million different places. And so before we can even think about like banning or versus not banning, it's like, what is the actual policy on any given day? Because frankly, like if I looked yesterday, what I thought three weeks ago would not be true. And probably there'd be like 19 more links for me to dig through in order to figure out what their approach is. And the one thing I'll just add real quickly is, you know, like Yosef was saying, Twitter doesn't allow political ads. And clearly the president has no problem spreading misinformation and disinformation on Twitter. Uh, the, 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 the core of the problem is really the organic unpaid content. Gotcha. Um, I think we'll have time for two more questions. That's my goal. Um, the first one being, you know, this problem is so massive. I'm curious um, what potential role there could be for um, government, uh, whether it's Congress or federal agencies um, in this space. I mean, we've seen rumblings of Section 230 bills tied to election um, related content or um, rumblings of bias in various aspects of our government. So um, yeah, I would love to get your thoughts there. So I, I would say that there's for, for one thing there, you know, voter intimidation is a federal crime and is a crime in many states. Um, the outlines of that are a little unclear and the, the, uh, the ways that it's enforced are not entirely uh, consistent. So um, one thing, there's a sort of easiest case is the deceptive practices, the vote on Wednesday, the voter intimidation, clarify in federal law that those are illegal the DOJ will enforce those laws. Um, and there's a bill you know, in Congress uh, to do just that. Um, that I think is the sort of obvious, easy first step is to clarify that these practices about disinformation about voting specifically, that they're trying to trick people out of voting by saying vote by text or other things are federal crimes and give DOJ the clear uh, mandate to enforce them. <clears throat> now, so, that's enforcement. The other piece of the puzzle, as, as many have mentioned, is providing correct information to people. Um, so uh, the government can do more, and this is maybe more of a state and local issue since states and localities actually run elections, to push out correct information, to work with the platforms to push out correct information, um, 
to make sure that everybody knows who to ask questions to if they don't know how to vote. Um, and, you know, Congress can certainly help with that, certainly provide financial and other resources uh, to do that. And, and there is some of that happening, including with uh, DHS uh, funding for sort of election security and cybersecurity. But um, I think there, there could be more. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of what we're seeing in the election context on these platforms is symptomatic of a deeper problem, which is the fundamental business models of these platforms in, in two respects, right? The first is, uh, you know, how the companies are collecting and analyzing massive amounts of personal information. And the second is how they are running their uh, engagement algorithms to optimize for the for for the most outrageous types of content and that amplifies bad actors more than good actors so you know if we want to get to systemic reforms and fixes what we really need is federal privacy legislation that regulates what kind of personal information the the a company can collect how they can use it things that they're forbidden from doing with it, like discriminating on the basis of race or sex, and, and get providing real meaningful transparency requirements, not just handouts, uh, and, and then get, uh, providing for robust enforcement mechanisms at all levels of, of government so that these companies can be held to account. Because let, let me tell you, you're not going to be micro targeting uh, specific tiny communities of, of black voters in certain cities as Channel 4 News just reported that the Trump campaign did in 2016. You're not gonna be doing that type of micro targeting without a data profile that has tens of thousands of data points on a person. So, you know, if you change the fundamental business model so that these companies aren't collecting and profiling and monetizing vast amounts of personal information, then you will change the way that the companies operate. You will change their incentives so that they are not incentivized to, to create an environment where the negative externalities of their business, the pollution of their business, is voter suppression and voter intimidation and hate and violence. So, you know, change the incentives, change the business models through systemic regulation, and, and you will address these other problems. Yeah, just real quick to build off of that, what Ian and David said are, are spot on. Um, I think another issue that's uh, tangentially related to voter suppression and content moderation is just competition and competition policy uh, that's currently non-existent. Um, a lot of the bad actors are the biggest platforms simply because of the size and scale of their platforms and how quickly disinformation is able to spread on their platforms. And we look at the various products and features that these platforms offer, it can be difficult to moderate at scale. We keep picking on Facebook, but um, if we look at Facebook, it has a public feature where folks can post organic content. It has a political ads feature where folks can put political ads micro-targeted to various communities. And it has a groups feature where you can be involved in closed groups of thousands of people spreading this information. So you're having three different components of a platform where disinfo can spread from one to the other quickly at times and no ability to, to enforce at scale. And so you have to look at what are the policies where you can actually promote competition amongst platforms, allow new entrants to enter into the space and look at ways where individuals can say, okay, I don't wanna be on Facebook anymore or Twitter anymore or whatever, and go to another platform with their data in hand. So there are various ways of looking at this. Privacy is one, competition is one, um, and looking at um, transparency through uh, election regulations is another one. Yeah, totally. Um, and I know we're at, time here, but I wanted to end with just one more audience question, which I think um, it's a, probably a good one to end with because it's probably really easy to listen to this conversation and feel really overwhelmed by all the ways in which um, platforms are being manipulated or um, used to spread false um, 
information about the election. So the question is, uh, what brief advice would you give a friend who is nervous about falling for election misinformation but has a hard time identifying it? I could just jump in real quick. Anytime you're see, you see something on social media and your immediate response is, oh my God, I have to share this right away. That should be your signal that you need to take a break and pause because the content that is really designed to deceive is designed to trigger that visceral emotional response. And so, you know, when you see something, you're like, oh my God, that's outrageous. I have to share this. Take a pause, think about it for a few minutes, maybe check and see if it's, it's really true. If it is true and important, it will still be true and important in five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, it's so important to anything that seems really shocking, really outrageous, or also too good to be true from your own political biases, right? It's always like the things that people share are the things where it's like, yeah, the, my side is really right and the other side is really wrong. Um, and, you know, some of the things that people, experts recommend to stop yourself from sharing misinformation is um, to check the source. Who's saying, is this a legitimate thing? Who's saying it? Are they, they post propaganda all the time. Is it a satire site that's really like jokes like The Onion? Um, and one of the things, uh, key skills is lateral reading. So you look at the thing and then you just put it down and go look for the information somewhere else. Google it. Half the time, if it's a hoax, there's already 10 article, news articles saying that it's a hoax out there. And you can just find that without even getting to the end of the article you saw in the first place. Or, you know, the headline or the tweet if you're, if you're not even getting engaging it. So, just look for other sources, look for legitimate um, trusted sources. And in the case of voting specific information, ultimately that's the people who run the election in your jurisdiction, your county election officials, right? They have a phone number. You can call them and ask them how to vote. Check their website, make sure it's their website and not you know, an imposter. Awesome. Um, great, well, I think that should um, pretty much cover everything. I mean, it's not everything, but with the time given, we <laughs> covered a lot of ground here. So I wanna thank our panelists for taking the time to um, inform everyone here um, and for just a lovely conversation um, about such an important topic. Uh, thank you to New America for organizing this and also thank you to our audience for um, taking time out of your day to hop into another video call uh, six months into <laughs> um, the pandemic. I really appreciate all of you. Um, and of course, this is an event from New America. So if you like it, feel free to go to New America's website, check out their other events there. It's all lovely. So great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>